You say the number of people in hospital has doubled. The number of people who've tested positive for COVID who are in hospital has doubled. Um, one of the, uh, the great sort of uh, spikes we've been seeing is in Bolton. How many patients are currently in hospital with coronavirus in Bolton? Uh, I haven't seen the figure, it's but I two. have. No, that's not true. It's so two. That's what the official figures state. Uh, no, well, that's not true. It's much higher than that. I've seen the I've seen the shape of the curve. I don't know the exact shape figure. Curve. Okay. Get back. Let's talk about shapes of curves, because we know that coronavirus uh, uh, cases are going up. But again, lots of people, including Carl Hennigan, professor of evidence based medicine at Oxford University, uh, who has uh, helped to influence some, uh, some changes in government policy recently, has pointed out these aren't cases of coronavirus. These are people who've tested positive for the test. Um, what is the false positive rate on the testing that we're doing in the community? Under 1%. It's under 1%. Um, yes. Even around under 1%, do you know the exact rate? Um, it's Well, under 1% means that for all the positive cases, I... the likelihood of one being a false positive is, is, is very small. Is there any scrutiny in the Cabinet of someone saying, hold on a minute, some experts are pointing out, and there's no statistical evidence that these people are wrong, that 9 out of 10 of the, of the positive cases we are identifying may actually be false, that we're basing an entire policy on false data? Yeah, I don't think we're, uh, I, don't, I don't think that's correct. I don't think we're uh, basing our entire policy on, on false data, as, as you've suggested there. Uh, I'm slightly confused by your figures, but I'm going to go away and check them because you also said that Matt Hancock said it's probably 1%. Uh, this is, no, but I'm so, so sorry. This is my policy. Test. This is a policy that's being made by people who don't understand the statistics and the science. Well, hold I on, can, you, I, well, I'll do. You, you I've, got your, I've got your phone number. I will send you the document to explain yeah, to you what this false positive paradox is. There, haven't you? You've said to me, uh, but Matt Hancock said it's one in 100. You've told no, me it's nine out no, of 10. These no, nine. this is the entire problem, Mr. Shapps. This is the problem. People don't understand what this means. If one, if the false positive rate is below 1%, 1%, that means that the, oh, when you have a very low prevalence in the, in the country and lots of people who aren't, aren't having symptoms are getting tested. This is pre, this is really basic statistical stuff. It means well, that I'll the false positive you... rate is nine out of 10. Uh, even the former prime minister said that you should improve testing at airports or indeed put pest, uh, testing in at airports and we don't, why not? The, the challenge is that the false positive rate is very high. So only 7% of tests will be successful in identifying those that actually have the virus. So the truth is you can't just rely on that. And I, in fairness, I don't think those advocating it think that you can. Hello, I'm Paul Weston, and this video is about false positive uh, COVID infection test results, which sounds pretty tame, but in reality is of crucial importance because they reduce the true number of positive COVID infection results uh, by somewhere between 90 to 100 percent. In other words, pretty much all of them. And the reason for this is because the inbuilt false positive error count in COVID testing, which is huge, uh, is not being subtracted from the raw number of tests returning an apparent positive infection label. Uh, by this, and I'll, I'll just get this out of the way quickly, I mean that the total number of tests returning a COVID positive result are actually made up of a number of true positives and a number of false positives. And in order to establish the scientific accuracy of the overall test results, the false positives must be subtracted from the overall figure, which leaves a new, much, much lower figure of true positives. And if this was done today, the number of true positive test results are reduced by 90 to 100 percent. I know it sounds hard to believe, but it's very much the case, um, backed up by Professor Carl Hennigan of Oxford University Centre for Evidence-Based Medicine. Professor Carl Hennigan is director for the Centre for Evidence-Based Medicine in Oxford. This idea of false positives is a really important issue. So I'm just going to walk you through this. I want you to think of we go and test 10,000 people, which is, you know, realistic right now. If I test 10,000 people and no people have the disease, nobody has it and we still test, 10 people will still be identified as having COVID, despite there's none out there. Now, this is important, and this is the problem with screening. You get to a certain prevalence, it's very, very, very low, that the accuracy of the test has to be hugely important. 
So basically what you're saying is as a disease gets rarer in the population, the chance of having a false positive test starts to rise. Correct. That's something quite big to get your head around because some of these tests are reporting that they are 99.98% accurate. Well, I've just described a test that has specificity of 99.9%. Now, some of the tests around the world are actually much cheaper, delivered in much speedier times, and their specificity is about 95%. So they have a huge number of false positives at low prevalence. And that's a real concern. Now, one of the concerns I have is even in the ONS survey, they still don't understand the specificity of the test. So this is the Office for National Statistics who put out weekly reports about how many coronavirus diagnoses have been made and they have said that they don't have accurate figures for how specific and how sensitive the tests are. The Office for National Statistics admits they do not, quote, know the true sensitivity and specificity of the test because COVID-19 is a new virus. And the more people that turn up for testing, the more likely you are to pick up people who are false positive. And I think we can agree this is pretty important, uh, considering our country is being locked down only because of the alleged positive COVID test results and nothing else. It's not deaths, it's not case fatality rates, it's not the overwhelming of the NHS, it's just dishonestly presented and deliberately distorted positive test results. It's accepted that if you test more, you're likely to find more cases. And in recent weeks, we've been carrying out a lot more tests across England. But if you look at the percentage of those tests that are positive, it tells an interesting story. There are small fluctuations, but the proportion of tests producing positive results stays pretty flat, and it's always below 1%. The government's own documents acknowledge when only a small proportion of people being tested have the virus, the operational false positive rate becomes very important. Despite this, the government also acknowledges there are no published studies on the operational false positive rate of any national COVID-19 testing programme. So false positives can have a big impact when there are low levels of virus circulating. So say a test produces 0.5% false positives. Doesn't sound much, but say you test a thousand people and only one of them are infected with coronavirus. The test may or may not pick up that person and it will also produce five false positive results. Public Health England says it's hard to rigorously establish false positives, but they do evaluate tests, labs have guidance, and they say that they think around 1-2% to are false positives. But some doctors are worried. The scale of testing is now massive, uh, and that's set against the situation of a declining rate of infection. And all of these really set the ideal conditions for false positives and potentially really quite poor decision-making on, a, on the back of these false positives. We're taking massive decisions. Uh, I mean, if we're locking down entire regions, entire cities on the basis of a test which has not been validated at this stage, this is very troubling. Now, all testing for a virus or a pregnancy or a cancer, you name it, has a built-in error percentage. And this is because the process of testing is subject to human error. Uh, to coding error, to machine error, to freezers at the wrong temperature, the age and deterioration of the material being tested, uh, etc, etc. And most of these error percentages are known. But as of today's date, the error rate for potential false positives in COVID testing is not known. And one government document suggests that the lowest error rate for false positives is 0.8%, with a higher rate of 4.3%, So a mean average rate of 2.3%. And I'll use the average 2.3% in the following calculations. But I would point out that even if the lowest 0.8% is used, it still demolishes the government lies about large and rising infection figures. Okay, so the government has carried out almost 20 million tests to date. See the yellow, uh, see the figure highlighted in yellow. Uh, which have returned 423,000 positive results, again highlighted in yellow. These are then presented to us as the genuine number of positive infection cases 
in order to terrify us. And this is an absolute scandal. It's a criminal act, in fact, because they haven't been adjusted for the 2.3% false positive error count. And I know it sounds small, but it's anything but. Uh, because it's magnified massively as the 2.3% applies not to the uh, 423,000 results figure but to the 20 million people tested figure. An inbuilt error percentage uh, only applies to the total number of people tested, not to the much lower test result figure itself. And this is crucially important for obvious reasons. 2.3% of 20 million is 460,000. That's 460,000 false positives, a figure far higher than the 423,000 unadjusted overall positives, uh, which suggests there are no true posit positives at all in terms of statistical relevance. So why is the government lying to us and why are they doing what they're doing? One answer is criminal stupidity. I've seen several ministers, including Hancock, interviewed by Julia Hartley Brewer, who asked them about the false positive figures issue, and they seem to think that if 10,000 tests returned 110 positives and the false positive error percentage was 1%, then the said 1% applies to the 110 positive results, therefore reducing the number to 109 a matter of little importance in the overall scheme of things, but they're wrong. It applies to the 10,000 tested, and 1% of 10,000 is 100, meaning the true positive number is only 10, not 109. This is hugely important, obviously, and to get it wrong because of crass stupidity or deliberate design is now a matter for government inquiries and the criminal courts. And I'm quite serious about this. This is a scandal, the scandal of the century, and it's more than capable of bringing this government down. The mainstream media don't want to acknowledge this or talk about it, but they'll be forced to do so shortly. And then this criminal government is toast. There's hysteria the last few months over the summer, even though I clearly showed in Europe that the epidemic was over since May. And the reason is because we're hyper testing with PCR. So I'll explain that. So here you have the curves I showed earlier in, uh, for Europe and you see the epidemics come down. This was an epidemic in fairness, and this is not an epidemic. Epidemic's over as we get out to June, July. However, if you kept testing with PCR and in fact increased your testing, you would find viral fragments, dead virus, people who recovered months ago who were asymptomatic, you'll find some positive cases, but there'll be very little impact. You'll have a case-demic. And that's the problem we're seeing in Europe over the past couple of months with stringent measures, draconian measures based on PCR testing. So this is a great post for you to get an idea of the problems with PCR testing. Just Google this term here. There's the link. Professor Carl Hennigan again goes through the challenges. If you hyper-test with PCR tests, they find viral dead fragments. They don't find full live virus. They can't identify that. They're calling them cases when they get a PCR positive. They are not, mostly. A case is hospitalization with severe impacts or COVID-19, the disease. Uh, these are simply positive tests from a viral fragment test kit. Uh, they are not cases. So a lot of confusion. Uh, this is what causes the case-demic. Uh, so to show a few countries, Ireland, we had an epidemic, rising cases and fall, and we had deaths follow it, sadly. Older, comorbid, average age 82, uh, median age 84. Um, so yes, we had an impact. Epidemic ends, but now we test, 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 test. We're getting PCR false positives, historical infections, some true positives, but the impacts are on the floor. So for Ireland in August, we had 700 cancer deaths, we had 33 suicides, we had effectively zero COVID deaths on the record. So, but all people are talking about is COVID. They don't care about the suicides, the cancers, the economic catastrophe. People don't seem to care about anything, even though they don't realize the epidemic's gone. UK briefly, I'll just show it's the same problem. Enormous cases, local lockdowns, 
nothing's really happening. Now, as we come into fall and winter, we will see a natural rise in the virome. We'll see influenza. We'll see more impacts in hospitals. Uh, we'll see SARS-CoV-2 um, rising again. But that will be more normal winter resurgent of influenza like prior years, I would say. Uh, Germany, same story. I won't read it out. Switzerland, exact same story. Uh, they brought in mandatory masks in these countries back here when the epidemic was already over. Um, that doesn't affect anything. Spain. Spain is being called out as having a second wave in the making. And sure, the deaths are rising a little. But uh, as we'll see, that's not unusual in Spain as they head into fall and winter. So there's pockets here and there. But there's only around one death per million people per day in Spain at the moment. And that's being seen as a surge. Uh, so it's vastly lower than when the real epidemic occurred. But this will probably grow, but that doesn't mean it's a second wave by any means. But you can see the enormous amount of cases here, right? Absurd. And then these very small impacts. And then we've got Netherlands, same story. And we've got France, same story. Talk of a second wave in France now just because hospitalizations have gone up a bit coming into the fall. But again, similar summary. And US, I'll acknowledge, as I already have, that because of the southern and western regions, they're virome triggered, so they genuinely do have, with extra cases, a rise in mortality. But thankfully, that's falling down now, too. So have we seen this before, like the case-demic phenomenon? And this is important. This is from a government document. And it shows the H1N1 swine flu, uh, where there were actual impacts in 2009 in the winter and people died, not nearly as many as were modeled. But a fascinating thing happened then. They brought out a rapid PCR test called flu chip and they started testing like crazy. And all during that summer when the deaths were gone from swine flu, there was a freak out with huge tests and all the media going crazy, uh, but no one was dying. So that was a case-demic. And they kept pushing it even into the fall, right? But H1N1, there were no real deaths. It had passed in its first season, as mostly they do. Uh, but there was a case-demic going on and a lot of hysteria until eventually they gave up on it. Now, the interesting thing is there were no lockdowns or masks back here during the safe summer. Uh, and that may have helped the following winter season be very soft because you had a lot of community immunity develop over the summer, uh, but without much death impact. So that point we're going to bring up at the end again in the context of Spain and see what it might mean. Last one on this, it just shows the UK and here's the seasonal increases in mortality, perfectly normal with influenzas. And down here we have the testing. But in 2010, in the summer, they were testing like crazy because of the swine flu panic. So you see an enormous spike in cases, but actually the lowest death that summer of the past 20 years. So it shows you the danger of a case-demic. Uh, this article, very important to read to understand why case-demics happen and the driving forces behind them. So it's a German mainstream Spiegel newspaper back in 2010 did this article. It's comprehensive and um, it really is a great article and explains a lot of, of what goes on when these things occur. So I recommend that. The test that we have for the virus does not tell us whether we have an active virus in a person. It's been called uh, by the media a case. And the UK has recorded almost 3,000 new cases of coronavirus. The rise in the number of cases that we've seen today is concerning. A case is when someone gets sick from a disease. That's completely different from a positive test. It's not a case at all. It's just that we can detect that at some time in the past, perhaps there has been viral infection, but it's probably been removed now. Even if there is some asymptomatic transmission, in all the history of respiratory-borne viruses of any type, asymptomatic transmission has never been the driver of outbreaks. You must not, you must not meet socially in groups of more than six. And if you do, you will be breaking the law. It has what's been calculated as an infection fatality rate. That is, if you catch the infection, the probability of you dying is 0.3%. 
So that means that 99.7% of people survive. 80% of people who catch this virus will be completely asymptomatic. Those people who uh, do catch the virus, many of them the effect will be like a bad flu. Those people who are actually hospitalized, then we do have very good treatments for these. And anyone breaking the rules uh, risks being dispersed, fined and uh, possibly arrested. As your Prime Minister, I must do what is necessary to stop the spread of the virus and to save lives. The government reaction is causing more deaths now and will cause far more deaths in the future than the virus itself.